Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy New Year. This is our first Sunday together as Horizon Church, so it is so good to see your faces, and I am so thankful to be your pastor and sing together with you that we're going to be brave in this year, that we are not going to be slaves to fear, but we are going to claim and proclaim that we are children of God. I am so thankful for that opportunity this morning. As we get started this morning with the message, I just want to ask you a simple question. And I want you to really think about it, but I want want to ask you this question. Do you want to stand out or do you want to blend in? Like, I I want you to be really honest with yourself. Do you want to stand out or do you want to blend in? I need to be really honest with y'all. I've been studying this message this week, and this is what sort of God has has laid on my heart that I, I just need to share with you. So many of us exhaust ourselves trying to stand out right? You work long hours, you put in hard time, like you're, you're doing the things that you are doing to stand out and you do it so you can blend in. So you can get the right car, the right house, have the right title, all the right things in your life. We work really hard to stand out in certain areas of our lives so we can blend in in other areas. So I want to ask you this morning to be really honest with yourselves Do you want to stand out or do you want to blend in? And this is my prayer, my hope. I think it's God's hope and God's dream for us that we will be people who stand out for the right things. That we stand up for the right things. That in this year we stand in the right things. And that this year we know When we fall and we can't stand anymore, that we do that in the right place too. And that's what this message series that we are going to start this new year with is about. It's about standing. It's about standing. This week we're going to talk about standing out for God. We're going to look at over the next four four weeks the book of Daniel. It's a book about a guy named... Daniel. Um, If you've heard the name Daniel, you're probably thinking Daniel in the lion's den. This is the guy. This is who we're talking about. Uh, Daniel, uh, the lion's den is last week, so y'all got to come the next three weeks to hear how he got there. Um, Y'all like that plug so I can get y'all here (laughs) every Sunday. So we're going to just look at the ways that Daniel, the story of Daniel, this guy who's an Israelite, how he stood out for God. But I I need to tell y'all a little story about how I've heard God asking me to stand out and how God has used other people standing out to bless my life so that you know, you know that what God is asking you to do this morning, the ways that God is asking you to figure out and step into standing out, that it matters and it's important. Um, you, You guys may have noticed this about me, but most of the time I stand out in a room not because I have red hair or I'm you know, talk louder than most people, but I stand out because I'm usually the most nervous and anxious person in the room. If you've ever had a meeting with me, you know my foot like shakes the whole time. I'm always kind of nervous and anxious about things. I stand out as being the most nervous and anxious person in the room. And a couple weeks ago, about a month ago now, three weeks ago, we, um, some leaders in our church were going in to meet with our contractor about Panorama. We're going to talk about our future home at the end of the service, so just hang in there with me. But we were going in to have a meeting with the contractor um, about Panorama, and I'm walking in the door with the leaders of our church to this meeting, and I look at one of them. His name is Jacob Sheehan. He's sitting right over here, and I look at him, and I said, I'm anxious. And he's like, yeah, like, what's new, right? He sat in many, many meetings with me. He's, he's seen me early on Sunday morning. He's like, okay, you're... Normal, right? Uh, things are things are normal headed in this door. So uh, he was like, yeah. And I, I looked at him and I was like just trying to be like lighthearted and fun too. I was like just halfway saying this. I was like, do you believe I'm going to be like this the rest of my life? And he said something to the effect of, you were probably born a little more anxious and high strung than, <laughs> than most people. You, yeah, I, I think you might be like that uh, for the rest of your life. And so, um, I, you know, we like laughed about it and, and went into the meeting. And I wouldn't have even remembered this moment except we went to the meeting. I prayed 
to start the meeting, we like kept things really spiritual in this meeting. We talked about the business of the church. We, we asked our contractor like business questions, but we, we kept it spiritually focused on, on the home of our church. We ended by talking about our lives and praying for each other before we, uh, before we left the meeting, before we dismissed it. We, we kept things really spiritual, but, but I need y'all to know Jacob like is ferociously like typing all the answers to these questions. He's asking these really challenging questions. Like for, we walk in the door and for an hour, he is like super engaged. Okay, we walk out and he looks at me. So he's not had like a ton of time to like think about this really like eloquent thing that he's going to say to me. But we we walk out the door of the meeting and and he looks at me as we go out. And I'm like, bye, have a great week. And, and he looks at me and he says, I need you to know something. I actually don't believe that you're going to be anxious the rest of your life. I, I, I believe even if you are, even if you are, I believe more in God's power to do something different and new in your life. I would have forgotten about us joking about that going into the meeting, because I say that to everybody at the beginning of the meeting. It's like, I'm a little anxious and nervous about this. I would have totally forgotten about that exchange at the beginning of the meeting if he wouldn't have taken the moment to stand out and stand on the promises of a God who restores and heals and makes us new. Your pastor, your pastor needed somebody to stand out in faith and claim the promises of God for her and over her. I don't believe it's going to be like this forever. I believe more powerfully in the healing and restoring work of God. I believe that has more power on your life than anything else. I needed to hear that, and I need y'all to hear me. This is why I need y'all to start standing out, because if your pastor needed to hear it, your kids need to hear that. They need to hear you stand out in the faith for God. It, the people you work with, they need you to stand out and claim these promises of God over them and for them. We're going to learn how Daniel did this in a way that wasn't weird, that wasn't strange, but that, that took the moment to stand out so that somebody could stand up in front of you all and claim the healing and powerful work of God. God needs us to stand out. The hopeless, the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, the give out, the exhausted, the desperate, they need you. You. I'm not talking to somebody else this morning. I'm talking to you if you're in this room. They need you to stand out and claim and proclaim the promises of God, the healing work of God. It's not going to be like this forever. I believe more powerfully in what God can do in and through you than anything else. I am telling you guys, my prayer this week for us is that we will stand out for the right things at the right time and in the right places because God is ready to do something powerful with those moments that we take a stand. Now let's go back to Daniel so we can learn how we can do that, okay? Because this story is going to teach us about how we can stand out for God, okay? There was a guy who was the king. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. I had an, I, I went to graduate school to become a pastor. We took some, some extra time to like study the, the history of the Bible and things about the Bible. And my Old Testament professor, my professor who like helps us learn about the Old Testament, he looked at us and he told us when we were studying Daniel, he's like, whenever I say King Nebuchadnezzar, y'all go, boo, he's a terrible guy, y'all. Like he's this old guy and he's like, he's awful, he's evil, he's terrible. So we'd say like King Nebuchadnezzar and he'd say it and we'd all boo and then he'd say like, okay, stop because that's annoying and I need to <laughs> get through my lecture. So y'all don't do that to me today. But King Nebuchadnezzar is just this evil, yeah. <laughs> he's just this awful, terrible guy, right? He's super evil. He's the king of a place called Babylon. Can everybody say Babylon? Babylon. Now say boo Babylon. Babylon. It is bad news. When we talk about Babylon, it is bad news, okay? And then there's this group of people called the Israelites. They live in Israel in a city called Jerusalem. Can everybody say Israel? Yeah. This is good. Good news. Israel is good, okay? So, so there's a guy named Daniel living in Israel, and this is what happens. Babylon and its kingdom comes in like they take over Israel, and they push them out of their home, Okay? So Israel is defeated. This nation is defeated. It is torn down and destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. The city is just absolutely flattened. They, they, they didn't just flatten the city and the marketplace and ruin their economy. They flattened, King Nebuchadnezzar flattened the temple, the place where they worshipped God. Flattened it, destroyed it. 
He, he and his servants went in and they stole things from the temple that people used to remember what it was. that got, Like they had these like things that they would, you know, use in worship. They didn't worship those things, but they would help point people to God. If some of you are sitting in here and you can remember the moments, like your worst moment ever, and somehow God saved you and rescued you from that, right? There's these, these moments or these memories or these things that maybe remind you of the God who rescued you and saved you from the worst day of your life. These people had a temple full of things that helped them remember that on their hardest and worst days, God saved their lives and had something special for them, had a purpose for them. They had a, a temple full of these things. And this king went in and he stole all of those things. And he didn't just steal them. He burnt some of them in a public offering in front of everybody to make fun of and mock their traditions. He destroyed their past. He tried his best to destroy their memory of who God is and what it is that God does for them. They took some of the artifacts back to Babylon and people like made fun of them, mocked them, like put weird stuff in them and did weird things with them. They did everything they could to destroy and mock the past of the Israelites. They tried to get them to forget about the power and redemption of God. I need y'all to hear this, okay? You may not be an Israelite and it may not feel like Babylon's coming to take over, but I believe this. I believe there are certain things at work in your life that try to distract you and make you forget about the God who indeed has control and power and wants to redeem and heal our world. There are things that will literally steal them and mock them. Try, try, to, try to convince you that that memory you have of a God who saves you and loves you and called you worthy and has a purpose for you, no, that that's not actually the story and that it's not important. There are things in your life that will do this. Okay? And I just need you all to hear that. And that's why it's important for us to see what Daniel did in the face of this. So he's got everybody back. He's destroyed their past, right? He's trying to destroy their memory. Then I want you to hear what he does. The king ordered Ashpenaz. Uh, what a name, right? Who's, y'all better not be naming your kids Ashpenaz around here. <laughs> chief of his court officials. So the king ordered the chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So we're going to stop right here for just a second. The royal family and nobility, these are good guys. Like they come from the right place and the right town. They know the right things. Then let's, let's hear what else about him. He says, go get these guys. Young men, this was his first mistake. I need y'all to know this. It didn't say young people. He only went after men. Why did he do that? Anyway, uh, young men, okay? He wants young men without any physical defect. Without any physical defect, he wants them to be handsome. He wants them to show aptitude for every kind of learning. He wants them to be well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. I need y'all to know that if the king was here, you all, and I believe this in my heart, you all would be the ones that he would choose. He's like, go get that group of people and bring them to me. Handsome, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. And this is what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. You all had a worksheet on your, on your uh, sheet. If you'll go ahead and pull that out. When you are asked to blend in, there are going to be moments in our lives where we are asked to blend in. The first thing that's going to be asked of you is to compromise your values. Did you see how the king did that? Like, we're going we're gonna to take your language. We're going to teach you the Babylonian language, and we're going to take the words that, that you speak of, of God, of healing, of goodness. We're going to take those from you. We're going to ask you to compromise your values. We're going to start by, by affecting what it is you read and consume. I need you to think at this new year, what are the things that are compromising your values? Because this isn't just a story. This isn't just a story about the Babylonians and the Israelites and Daniel and how he stood up for God. This is a story that still has power for us today because this is, there are things in your life that are going to ask you to compromise your values. What is asking you to compromise your values? This is what happens. They try to get you to blend in, to compromise your values, the language, the, the things you read, the way you speak, the way you interact. They train them, right? They, they changed the way they physically were doing things. 
he, they tried to change everything about their life. The things that they valued, they were asked to compromise their values. I want you to, I want you to think about that. What things in your life are, being, are compromising your values? Okay, so this is, this is step one of blending in. Okay, instead of standing out for the right things at the right time in the right place, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to, that people are going to ask you to compromise, people or things are going to ask you to compromise your values. Um, let's, let's read the next set of scripture. Among those who were chosen, so among these guys who were chosen from, were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Okay, so he chose those. The chief official... Listen to this. The chief official gave to them new names. To Daniel, he named him Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Do you, anybody ever heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's week three. <laughs> We're, they're going to get thrown in a fiery furnace. Y'all come and find out what happens to them. Uh, so to blend it, but did y'all hear what the king did? What did he do? He changed their names. To blend in, people are going to ask you to change your identity. They might not say, Gretchen, you're going to be Grace from now on. That'd be a good change, though. Uh, but th they may not ask you. They're, they're probably not going to change your name, but they're going to ask you to start identifying with things that change you being connected to the core of who you are and who God has created you to be. Literally on the way here, I drive my uh, father-in-law's car here on Sunday mornings, and he was listening to some financial radio, and this financial advisor that helps people in their retirement is on, and literally on the way here, and he says the biggest problem with people... Um, that, that I see when I'm like advising them about their future and their finances is, is they have no identity. Their only identity is their career. He said, I work with physicians and the only thing, the only value they see in their lives is that they are a doctor. So I'm asking you, as you look at this, at this year, how do you identify yourself? If it's only by your career or your job or some place in your life, this is the first thing that happens when you start to blend in, your identity, the core of who you are and who God has created you to be, changes. They might not change your name, but they're going to change who, like what you're deeply connected to. Things will start to, to, to sort of whittle away at that and mess with it. To blend in, people are going to ask you to change your identity. What things are coming after your identity? Is it your job? Is it your, your role as a parent? Is it, is it your friendships? What things are wrapped up in your identity? And what identity is it that God has given to you? Because to blend in, they're going to ask to change your identity. Let's uh, read this next part to, to see what happens. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So he's like, you can bring me all that choice food and stuff, but I don't want it. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Before we move on, this isn't one of the points in here, but I need you to know we serve a God who's working for you out ahead of you. If God is calling you and asking you to stand out for something, God is already at work ahead of you. This, this chief official has no reason, no reason to have compassion with Daniel, but God was at work in his heart and life ahead of him. I need you to know right now. Okay. I need y'all to claim this. God is working out ahead of you so you can stand out for the things God's asking you to do. He calls the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, listen here, Daniel, I am afraid. I am scared to death of the Lord, the King, his boss is what he's saying. He who has assigned you this food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Like, I'm not going to feed you some different food and you look bad. The king would have my head because of this, right? That's what he says. So let's keep going, see what happens. But Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, he said, please just test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. So he agreed to this test and tested them for 10 days. When you start to blend in, th this is what's going to happen. He's like, at the end of the 10 days, they look, listen to this, listen to this. At the end of the 10 days, they've eaten nothing but vegetables and drank water. They looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young, young men who ate the royal food. There's some more, right? Keep going. To blend in, 
to blend in. They're going to ask you to callously go after what you want. That king's official was afraid of what? His boss. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of that's callously asking you to go after what it is you want and to protect you? Because this is what's going to be asked of you to blend in. You're going to forget that, that Daniel's standing in front of you. Listen, everything in my life, chief official, has been stolen from me. The place where I grew up, my friends, my family, my food, my language, everything's been taken from me. Can you please just not make me eat the food too? Can you please do that? And he's like, nope, I care about my head more than I care about your heart. Callously, <laughs> that's my kid taking notes. <laughs> this mama's heart is proud. All right, to blend in, you callously go after what you want. Think about the things that you are callously going after what you want, and you're not thinking about anybody else around you. Okay? But I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. God is ready for you to stand, take a stand. The guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, listen what happens after they eat only vegetables and drink water. God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. To stand out, settle in to a life with God. Settle in to a life with God. It's not going to come from striving to be the best when the king has appointed you to do something. It comes into settling in to a life with God. What does it look like this year? I'm not asking you to do all these really hard things this year. What does it look like to just get up and spend five minutes quietly praying? This year? What does it look like to just read a chapter or two of the Bible every day this year? What does it look like to have dinner, right? Jesus had dinner with lots of people. What does it look like to just have dinner once a week with people you love? What does it look like to settle into a life with God? What's one thing you can do to just kind of settle into a life with God? Daniel's like, I, I, I'm not, I'm sorry, King. I don't, I don't love you enough to want, to want to win your approval. I just want to eat the food. Can I have this one thing, this one bit of food? Because he knew he could settle in to a life with God better with that. I'm asking you guys this week to stand out. Just begin settling in to a life with God. Don't strive. Don't try to read the Bible in a day or any of that stuff. Just settle in to this pattern, this rhythm, this life with God. To stand out. The second thing that um, you're going to do, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, listen to this. The king talked with them, and he found none equal. He thought Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah were the best, so they got to enter the king's service. So they didn't do everything the king said, and they still got appointed and promoted to the good stuff, okay? In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned him, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Ten times better. Settling, guys, I need y'all to hear, this settling and this striving, settling does make you ten times better sometimes. The world will tell you something different. It will tell you it makes you ten times worse. But this settling instead of striving does give you this, this life, this, this peaceful life with God. To stand out, get rooted in your identity with God. They changed their identity and Daniel's like, nope, I'm Daniel. And I don't eat that, that meat and that wine that you've, you've done everything else with. I'm, I don't do that because I know that my identity is in God. I'm an Israelite and I will eat those vegetables and drink that water and that's what I'm going to do. For you, it may be this is deeply who God has asked me to be. I care deeply about seeing hungry people eat. I care deeply about education. I care deeply about what is it that, that God has like sort of knit deep down in your heart as your identity, your calling, something you were created for. Get rooted in your identity with God to stand out. And finally, to stand out, courageously seek a godly life. I, I'm just going to say this because I don't know any other way to say it. We live in a world where Christians often stand up with their Bibles in front of everybody, and they say, I'm taking this stand, and this is how it's going to be, right? Daniel didn't do that. Did he stand up and make an announcement that he was going to eat different food? No, he courageously asked for different food, and he quietly and humbly and gently lived a different life. I'm not asking y'all. I'm not asking y'all to stand up at podiums and, and proclaim the Word of God. God might be asking some of y'all to stand out and do that, and I'll pray for you when you do it. 
But some of you are just asking to, God is just asking you to courageously seek to live a godly life, to say no and resist some things around you, to say yes to some things that matter. God is asking you to courageously seek a godly life. Y'all notice that the top half of that sheet of paper was empty, and that's because I wanted you to write this in. Blending in is a sprint. You do these small little increment hard striving things over and over and over and over again, and you are exhausted and you are out of breath and you are anxious and you are frantic because blending in is a sprint. It are these short moments, these short little bursts of, of, of busting it. Blending in is a sprint. Standing out is a marathon. It is habitually getting up and doing the thing day after day after day after day. Standing out is a marathon, and you don't have strength to run it on your own. Daniel didn't have strength to eat vegetables and drink water on his own. Who gave him strength? Who gave him the wisdom? Who gave him the things he needed? God will give you the strength you need to stand out. You probably aren't going to get noticed. Y'all probably know the name. If I say Damar Hamlin, does most people in this room know what that is? Six days ago, right, he collapsed on the, the field in front of an NFL crowd. Everybody here knows the name Damar Hamlin, but tell me who drove the ambulance that took him from the field to the home. Every single day, that, that ambulance driver has, has practiced. He's done the thing every single day. He stood out for the right thing in the right place at the right time. Are you willing to be the ambulance driver? Who was the trainer who gave him CPR? You might know because he went viral. You might not go viral for standing out this year. But can you still stand out for the right thing in the right place at the right time? Because I promise you there are people around you who are desperate, who are desperate for us to stand out for the right thing in the right place at the right time this year. Will y'all pray with me? God, I thank you so much for these people. I thank you for the identity that you've given to each of them as your child. I thank you, God, that those who are tired of standing up and standing out, God, you'll give them the strength to stand out for the right thing in the right place at the right time. I pray for a, a room full of ambulance drivers, God, of people who just get up and do the thing day after day after day to bring glory to you, that we will stand out, that we will stand out for the right things in the right place at the right time so that the hopeless and hungry, the exhausted and give out, the desperate, God, will know of your goodness and of your love. And for those of us sitting here this morning who are, aren't, aren't quite convinced that we are yours, God, for those who can't quite claim their identity as your child, I pray for courage and strength and grace over their lives. That in this moment, they can, they can see like Daniel, you can just humbly and gently, there might not be fireworks for this moment, but we can just humbly and gently step into a faith that helps us to stand out in a world that begs us to blend in. I pray for that strength and courage over people this morning. Amen.